Good news, MCU fans. We finally time slipped to the best of all Marvel content timelines. From the same team who faithfully broke down Secret Invasion episode by episode. We're finally getting our just desserts, a show that will have everyone talking in a good way with a side of suspiciously green key lime pie. Join me, David, and my co-hosts, Jean and Alicia, in the Lorehounds feed each week for a new helping of the MC universe as we break down Loki Season 2, episode by episode, covering all the angles from casual fans to Marvel stands. Plus production news and rumors. And of course, comic book comparison. So pack your pruning sticks. And don't stand too close to the temporal loom. You're going to need a clear head for the time storm ahead. Because Kang is coming. Warning, the Lorehounds Loki coverage is part of a healthy podcast listening lifestyle. Side effects may include temporal mind meltdowns and irrevocable love for Oscar winner Kei Hui Kwan. Welcome to the Lorehounds One Shots, where the Lorehounds, your guides to the Mike Flanniverse. I'm John. And I'm Alicia, and this is our coverage of the Netflix original series, The Fall of the House of Usher. In this podcast, we're going to have a short breakdown of the show, starting with our spoiler-free hot takes. Then we'll discuss our favorite parts of the show, our theories about the characters, and where this lands in Mike Flanagan's renowned portfolio. Stick around to the end of the podcast for programming notes about all podcasts on the Lorehounds networks, including mine. A quick reminder that if you are into what we do and you want to support us, you can visit patreon.com slash the lorehounds. You can find that link in the show notes for as little as three dollars a month. You can get ad free versions of all of our podcasts, early access and a bunch of other exclusive content. Another way you can help out the podcast is to leave us a star rating and review. Apple Podcasts is a great way to help poke the algorithms, which help with our visibility on the interwebs. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us or use the contact page on our website. We've got a contact form or a voicemail feature. Send emails to lorehounds at thelorehounds.com. Any feedback we get for this show, we will read on the next Lorehounds One Shot podcast. So if you want to join in the conversation in more real time, you can join our Discord server, which you can also find in the show notes. We've got a really fun, welcoming community. We've got channels set up for all the different shows. We've got a thread for the fall of the House of Usher. So, uh, yeah, definitely check the show notes and join us over there. Alicia, you're joining me here on this one shot. David was thinking about doing this series with us. I think he wasn't quite sold on it, but yeah. um, I'm excited I think to talk he was about worried. it with you. Yeah, he was worried he wouldn't be able to do it in a timely way, which... That's right. fine. It's fair. Right. Now he can listen to us and we can tell him why he has to watch this show because it was so good. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. Um, so one shots, if you're new here, are our one time conversations about shows that we don't either we don't want to or we can't cover um, in, in full. This is a binge show. It was always going to be a one shot. It, uh, it We've learned that it does not pay to cover binge shows episode by episode. So This is going to be our only conversation on this feed about it. But Alicia, first plug here, and I promise several, (laughs) you are doing a much fuller breakdown on your feed. Isn't that right? Uh, Yes. Well, I mean, it's going to be a longer episode. Um, I'm going to be doing it with my sister, the person I grew up watching horror movies with. And that's going to be going into, you know, all of the details of uh, what exactly what Poe's stories were used and how and uh, the themes and stuff that that uh, were brought out of that. And yeah, just silly shenanigans with my sister as well. Oh, and uh, also in the book club is going to get a full audio production versions of The Fall of the House of Usher and The Raven. Oh, very the cool. Stories from Poe. Yeah. I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, so... I um I wanted to talk about the series with you because I knew I was going to love it from loving Mike Flanagan in the past. I think the only thing that didn't really hit for me was the Midnight Club. And even then, it was a fun ride. It just wasn't as good as his other stuff. I, I, and, I liked Christopher Pike growing up, so I liked the Midnight Club. But. OK, OK. I, I, I had no nostalgia for it. So I, I think that's where I was. I was uh, not too into it. But anyway, the point is Mike Flanagan, A plus all the time. And I am I was so looking forward to the series for such a long time. I think this was one of the most pre announced shows he had 
like one of the most hyped up ones because I think mm-hmm. we heard about it last year, which is unusual for him. But it's also and, the last for Netflix. Oh, right, right. Is Do we know where he's going next? I mean, isn't it with Amazon? He's been talking about the adaptation for the um, Dark Tower. Okay. Okay. That's cool. I would, yeah. I would watch that for sure. He, he would be perfect for that. I can't right. think of a single person on the planet who'd be more perfect to adapt that book. Those oh, books. definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Well, I'm excited to see what he do, does next, but I think we need to talk about this series first. So before we get into the meat of it, and there's a lot of meat, let's talk about what we thought about the series without spoilers. Can you give your spoiler free hot take? Uh, sure. So I think I think I'm probably biased as a Poe super fan, but this is my favorite thing that he's done. I think it ties with uh, Hill House, basically, because Hill House was scarier than this, which I know for some mm-hmm. people, the fact this is less scary is probably a good thing for many people. For me, oh, it could be scarier, but it just feels like his most mature work in terms of um, tying things together, it, just weaving things together is the better word because there's a lot of craftsmanship on yeah. display yeah. here. And it's just the balance of timing and character development. And I just think he handled it uh, very well. And I would give it like a 9.5 out of 10. Yeah, they uh, we, we talk a lot about the importance of a finale, especially with some recent shows we've covered. But this show, I think, lands the finale better than any of his other shows. I think the other shows have good finales. This has a great finale. And it really it really does, like you said, tie it all together. Yeah, agreed. I um, was also pretty hot on it. I I think I agree with you. It's it's at least tied with Hill House. It might be higher up on my list than Hill House. Mm -hmm. Um, Absolutely right that it's less scary. I would say, you know, for the Marilyn Arpukilas of the world who don't like gore, it is very gory. There's a lot of gore. I mean, it's like the end of every episode is going to be a gory right. moment. Yeah. But that's also like the most important parts of the episode, right? Right. It's, it's, that's uh, when it all comes together. Yeah. Right. So if you if you need to skip the gore, you're probably not going to like the show. So, uh, yeah, uh, that would be my wording on this. I think that there's a lot of physical violence. Um, there is less there. There's very few jump scares. If that's something that bothers you a lot, there's a couple, but not a lot. And I appreciate that because jump scares are are widely regarded as the cheapest scare in horror. <laughs> See, I didn't um, have I didn't jump at all while watching, but maybe I don't know. Maybe I'm I think there's a inside. couple. Yeah, there's just a couple where that. you see something show up very suddenly. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I agree with you. If you're if you're used to horror, it's nothing. But mm-hmm. if you're not used to horror, then yes, there are a couple jump scares. Right. Mm-hmm. Not a lot, though. I think he doesn't he doesn't lean on it. It's more about what I love about Mike Flanagan is he uses horror as like a palette of colors to paint a picture of the human experience. Right. Rather than focusing on the horror itself. Right. I and mean, it's more about the horror of humanity and the things right. that we do to each other. Right. Yeah. I mean. I think that this series does really stress like the harm that one person can do if they mm-hmm. rise high enough, right? Right, and the and the good too. That's yeah, like the yeah. silver lining that he slips in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think um, if you like Succession and you like horror, you're going to really love this yeah. series. I like this better than Succession, but I'm inclined to because it's <laughs> horror. <laughs> I uh, I don't know. I like them both for different reasons, but this is this is definitely very successful, especially in the first yeah. few episodes. I think it just feels really OK. This is the succession Halloween special. I, ca- I can't remember who said this, but someone called it succession meets final destination. Oh, so I think somebody in our discord did that. <laughs> yeah, that's really well, I've also heard a lot of people call it the succession Halloween special, which I think it's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. It's a really great series if you're not doing the Mike Flanagan thing and you like horror in any way, you got to get mm-hmm. in on it. If you, if you don't like horror, I think, I think still maybe give it a shot unless you're like really, really sensitive to it um, or really, really sensitive to gore. But overall, I would absolutely recommend this series to anyone who has any interest in any of this. Agreed. Absolutely. So why don't we talk a little bit about what the series is now that we gave our glowing reviews. It is, Largely based on the writings of Edgar Allan Poe. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, Alicia, since that's going to be your focus on your podcast? Uh, yes, sure. So uh, Mike Flanagan, you know, with these specials these uh, that he's done every Halloween for Netflix until now, um, 
each one kind of focuses on the writings of one particular author. And in this one, I think it, he did the best job of really weaving it all together. Just the various different stories you can tell. A bunch of them are episode titles, but there's more in there. And then he also weaves in real life details from Poe's life. And um, he uses this. And really, it's like he's taking these themes that pop up again and again in Poe's writing that obviously also resonate with Mike Flanagan. And that's, you know, these are like the the famous Flanagan monologues and stuff. That's where these are coming from. Um, and yeah, I, it's, I, I, you know, I don't want to give away they, in the first episode, I have to say they do give away what the, um, what the setup of the series is going to be, like what the structure is going to be. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, you go through and you, you meet these different elements of the family. And so the Raven and, um, the fall of the house of Usher are the frameworks that they use for this story. But it, that story, the fall of the house of Usher really only has three characters. And so he fills in a, a bunch of other characters taken from other pieces of Poe's life or writings mm-hmm. and creates this like tapestry story. But so I have to ask you, John, as someone, I mean, you're not as into Poe as I am, I'm assuming. I'm right? not a Poe stan. Not yeah. that I don't like him. I just haven't really read a lot but, of them. Okay. But so a lot of these names and and such are new for you. So Correct. Um, yeah. Uh, did it all feel like it held together regardless where you, you know, it didn't feel yeah, like. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I have some of like the cultural Poe, you know, like I knew mm-hmm. the Raven is a big thing with Poe. I knew about, you know, I know some of his more famous stories, like the knocking under the floorboards and things like that. But um, I don't know really what his stories have to say. Uh, my wife knows more Poe than I do, and she was filling me in a little bit along the way, but not quite a lot. So I, I think it really held together on its own. OK, that's good. Yeah, that's good to hear, because. I mean, I've been hearing things from both, uh, good things from both Poe fans and non-Poe fans, although we were just hearing the Discord that some people, you know, have their quibbles, which is fair. Um, Quibble away. Yeah, quibble away. That's what art is for. (laughs) Exactly. All right. So it's based loosely, I think, um, on the writings of Edgar Allan Poe because it's not based on one story. Right. It's based on a bunch of them woven together, and it's very impressive to see how he does that. Yeah, that's super cool. That's super cool. All right, so I'm going to flip the switch on spoilers here. We are going to talk full spoilers about the series. I'm going to talk for another minute about it so that you can get out of here if you need to, if you're driving and you need to click the pause button quick. Um, We will talk full spoilers for the whole season. So if you have not finished the season or you care about spoilers, I would get out now. Uh, I hope you enjoy the podcast if you're sticking with us. And if you are not, I hope you come back after you finish the season. All right. Spoilers abound. Alicia, I'm going to read a quick plot synopsis. Uh, It's going to be very high level and I'm going to leave out a lot of important things, but (laughs) we need to (laughs) summarize this in a paragraph somehow. In 1979, Roderick and Madeline Usher make a deal with a mysterious bartender named Verna. They will achieve their dreams and never face any consequences until the moment before they would have died anyway. At that point, their bloodline would be taken from them as payment. In 2023, the bill comes due as Roderick watches his children and grandchild die one by one in mysterious accidents. The Usher twins and their attorney, Arthur Pym, fail to stop Verna from killing the family. When Roderick finds his granddaughter dead, he returns to his childhood home where he kills his sister and entombs her in the basement. He spends the rest of the evening giving his confession to Prosecutor August Dupin. When he finishes the confession, Madeline awakens and blindly strangles Roderick as the house collapses on top of them. August escapes and retires, visiting the graves of the ushers. When you make it linear like that, it's kind of a simple plot. Yeah. It's just he tells it in such a creative way that it doesn't feel that simple. No, you're you're engrossed in the details of the world because... You know, when after the first episode, basically it was clear, okay, six of his kids die. How many episodes are there? One kid dies per episode. Right, right. I can already tell as a Poe fan from their names who's dying in which episode and how, roughly. Oh, really? Uh, That's so, interesting. So it wasn't like, you know, that I was surprised by things. But then again, I was, you know, because it was all about how it was woven together and the because everything's updated to the new, um, to the new age. Like, for instance, there's a lot about opium imposed writing because that was right, a huge right. thing in his day um 
And so that becomes pharma and cocaine and, you know, um, they're just updating in, in these ways. Mm -hmm. Like Poe was very into cryptography. Uh, he helped like fan the, that movement, the craze for that. And okay. that becomes AI in this version is, I, hmm. I think. Yeah. Interesting. I, I had assumed that they were just doing it in reverse birth order. Not, um, I didn't know that they was also tied to the Poe titles. Mm -hmm. So that's super interesting to me. It took me, it took me a few episodes to be like, oh, they're just going in reverse of the birth order. Yeah. But I guess okay. that was also intentional that they assigned them all of the, uh, the Poe names where they belonged. Yeah. I mean, it's really like he put together this massive puzzle. Yes. Yeah. And it was, it felt really satisfying to be able mm -hmm. to unravel it as it went through. Um, and I have to credit my wife. She picked up on things a lot, a lot sooner than I did. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mrs. Lorehound, I did not, my, uh, I didn't pick on the, up on the birth order thing, although I did know that Roderick had to be the last. Yeah. Yeah. The, I think the birth order thing was mine, but she's the one who came up with the idea of, um, Verna being the devil, which I, I now know is debunked, but, um, I like that idea still. And the seven deadly sins. That was her okay. idea too, and I think that that is such a good theory, and uh, we'll we'll go through it as we go in. But um, I'm I'm sold on them being the seven deadly sins. Yeah, no, it's it, since you uh, brought it up, it makes a lot of sense. Although I've I had another theory uh, as a po fanatic watching too. Okay, I'm really excited to hear that theory because I I don't again I don't know a lot about Poe. What kind of um, Mike Flanagan are you familiar with, Alicia? Um, well, I've, I've watched all of his Halloween stuff, but other than that, I have to say, I've only watched, um, the Dr. Sleep, you know, the sequel to the shining and yeah. So I just recently saw the Gerald's game, uh, which it was a Mike Flanagan movie and it stars Carla Gugino and Bruce Greenwood. Um, so yeah. Have you seen that one? I haven't, I haven't. It, uh, it was. It came out, I think, before I really was into horror as much, and I just haven't revisited it. It it was a tough watch. They were both very good, but then it's kind of like I want to. I'm gonna. I'm rewatching now the Fall of the House of Usher uh, to prep for the pod that I'm doing, and it's like cleansing my mind to be able to see Carla Gugino be this, you know, cool uh, character right, of fate right. as she put it herself, rather than. Yeah, I don't want to, no spoilers for the other one, but uh, she is a woman wronged over and over. Yeah, yeah. It's hard watch. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I've seen the trailer of it. I know what you're talking mm -hmm. about. Uh, definitely a much different character than Verna. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so it's, it just makes me think, though, about how Mike Flanagan takes, um, like he, in that case, he's taking, he is apparently a very good adaptation of that Stephen King story. Uh, mm. And this is a very good adaptation of Poe's stories. Uh, so he's really great at adapting things for some reason, and because they feel, even though they have the same actors, they feel completely different. Uh, and because they're reflecting the tones and the messages of the original stories. But at the same time, you can see his signature, you know, just examining of the darkness of humanity that he right. does in his storytelling. Yeah, he's so good at it. Um, Speaking of of Carla Gugino, can we talk about Verna? Mm hmm. Who is she? I mean, obviously you have the anagram there. Mm hmm. She's a raven. Yeah. And and she even points that out in that you you sent yeah, an interview she, over. Yeah. Uh, pretty soon before we um we we started recording and and shut down my theory completely on, on the <laughs> devil thing. But um, she at the end we see her with like black feather sleeves and stuff, and she almost kind of morphs into the raven. Not quite right. on camera, but at one point the camera moves away, and then the raven's there when it goes back. Right. Yeah, I mean, I buy her being the raven, but what is the raven then? You know. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, it's uh, some sort of uh, for me. Uh, you know, the thing I didn't reason why I didn't go with the devil theory is that I see every death she's offering she's offering a choice. Like she, every, she offers each kid. There's a way that you can do this better where you can do the right thing. And then, mm -hmm. you know, as she explains to Freddie, when he gets sliced in half, she's like, well, I could have done this any easy old way, but you had to go and pull your wife's teeth out. Yep. Yep. 
I, I so, could not believe he did that. And that that was I think that might have been the darkest moment of the series for me. Yeah. Well, I was I was trying to match up his story to um, the pit in, in the pendulum, which is about a man being tortured by the Inquisition. And then mm. I realized, oh, he's the Inquisition. Mm. And the Inquisition stops and the character lives. Interesting. Interesting. Um, Verna, I was just thinking about this before this. Is she perhaps death itself? Yes. And she's, she's, you know, she, she basically makes a deal with the Usher twins at the beginning. Yeah. Basically saying, yeah, I'll, I'll give you what you want, but you're giving me however many souls exist at the time of your death um, and they, in your family line. They also made some demon at the crossroads references. So I don't know how yes. literally we're meant to take that. Right. Yeah. They, I think they said devil, right? Like uh, the devil at the crossroads. Oh, um, yeah. Okay. Perhaps. Um, yeah. So that's, that's another reason yeah. why I was like, it has to be the devil. They're alluding to it and everything. But I, I, I guess if she's Carla Gugino old. says it, she's an, uh, she's an authority on it. Yeah. She's older than humanity. So we know that. Right. And she keeps going, you people, you, you're yeah. kind. this, you know, mm-hmm. very like removing herself from the equation. The scourge on the earth. Yeah. Right. Right. But what's interesting is if she's death, and if she wants more death, why is she showing Roderick all the death he caused and being very scolding? But about I don't it? think that death wants more death. Like think also of the death from uh, the Sandman. You know, she's okay. not she's not like craving more souls. She right. It's 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 her job. It's what she has to do, and so she tries to do it in the best way possible. And then yeah, in Verna's case, you have to kind of agree like. She tries to give um, lost Lenore at the end the very best death possible. Um, right. But everyone else, she's like, you know what? You've earned a little worse. Like, you were just a terrible person. So I'm just going to have a little fun. Right, right. Yeah, she does give everybody an out. And then Lenore, I, I like what she says. There's a lot about my job that I love, but this is not part of right. it. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's um, so yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. It's not about racking the numbers up. It's about. Ex- exerting justice on these people. Right. Yeah. That's why I called, I was thinking of her as like an angel of vengeance as mm. the series went on. Interesting. And there's just no vengeance to have against Lenore. Poor Lenore. No, poor Lenore. Lost Lenore. Oh, I knew as soon as like, as soon as they said her name, uh, the Raven is about a man mourning his lost Lenore. I'm like, oh, she oh, dies no. in the last episode. <laughs> yeah, she sure did. She yeah. sure did. Um, and I really liked how how uh, Verna goes. Why do I have to explain to them the meaning of bloodline? Right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I picked that up right away. But then again, is because I also knew Lenore was going to die. So yeah. I know a lot of people on Twitter were like, "What?" <laughs> I was hoping she would live, but by mm-hmm. the time we got there, I was kind of convinced it wasn't going to happen anyway. Um, yeah. It was still very sad when it happened, though. Yeah, it was very sad, but it was it was beautiful, you know, that she tells her. And just the war, that was one of the speeches that really gave me some misty eyes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I really liked that. You know, as much as I criticized Mike Flanagan for his overuse of monologue sometimes, mm-hmm. uh, that that's like basically my only complaint about Mike Flanagan is I think sometimes he gets a little self-indulgent on the monologues. Mm-hmm, um, that's fair. One, one, he used them sparingly in this season, which was great. And two, the only one that really bothered me in this season was the lemon one. I was like, ah, this is just kind of cringe to me. Okay, but I thought it was funny, but I, I know you worked in marketing. It, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I just, I was just like, I don't care about this. The lemon one, I was like, move on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, but the Lenore one was really, really good. That was really beautiful, like you said. Right. Yeah, and the use of Poe's poetry throughout was just also Chef's kiss. Yeah, I was assuming it was Poe poetry, but I poetry. All right, um, poetry. But I, yeah, <laughs> I couldn't, um, I couldn't place it. I, I think I po- poetry it. sounds like something the police write. <laughs> That's funny. Um, now that we've talked a little bit about Verna, and I don't think we're ever going to get to the answer of who she is, but no. can we talk about the ushers and the seven deadly sins theory? Yes, please break down. I, in, I see it before me, but break it down for the listeners because I've decided that I'm completely in on this. Okay, so if, if you're not familiar with Catholic mythology (laughs) um there's this idea that there are seven deadly sins that all are like the worst possible sins they're the traits of humanity that really get them into trouble 
and you know in excess all these things lead to lead to hell basically and i think and i think alicia you're on board now yeah um that the ushers represent these sins and part of this is that other than Roderick and Madeline, they all have a color assigned to them that shows up through their outfits and their their surroundings through their episodes, but will take over the screen by the moment of their death. And I thought that that was a really cool way. It was much better done than Kaleidoscope. It the the, the colors actually meant something, right? Which was uh, very impressive to me. So the seven deadly sins are greed, sloth, envy, pride, gluttony, wrath, and lust. And here's the way that I broke it down. And I will, again, say my wife, Maya Lorehound, she helped me break this down. We, we kind of debated which one was which for a while. Roderick and Madeline together, because they're twins and Verna loves symmetry, they represent greed. Freddy is sloth. Tamerlane is envy. Victorine is pride. Leo is gluttony, Camille is wrath, Perry is lust. And with the colors, I, I went back to each death scene and I picked the color out. Freddy with sloth is dark blue. Tamerlane with envy is green, which makes sense. Victorine with pride is orange. Leo with gluttony is yellow. Uh, you'll notice that he died next to a yellow car. Uh, Leo, I already just said Leo. Uh, Camille with wrath is light blue. Uh, Perry with lust is red, okay. and then when they when they're dead, Verna shows up and it wash it washes out again. Yeah, no, it's interesting about the um, the colors and and you know trying to match them to the different sins because I had I don't know some years ago I used to throw theme parties with a friend who has the same birthday and we did a seven deadly sins party and we tried to like tell people what colors to wear and we just. I don't know. We just had to leave it open because there is no consensus other than green is no. envy. Yeah. And wrath yeah. is yeah. It's Lust yeah, there really is no consensus. And I was like, what is what am I gonna do with this? But I, I think he just wanted to differentiate them and I think he wanted to have yeah. each one have this sort of theme. I think it really reinforces the theme of each one has a different primary yeah. sin. And it not, was great that's production not to say, design too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not to say that they don't all have parts of the other deadly sins in them. But I think that these sins that I've I've laid out here are the the things that really defined their character failings. Right. Right. No, I agree. When I um, after we had this conversation, when I was like looking at the sins and the characters side by side, I couldn't break it down any differently. You were you were a little skeptical uh, of some of the assignments, though. I'm curious what your but have you, assignments were. Um, I don't know. Have you changed? Because I feel like you've changed some of them, too. I think one thing I was skeptical about was Roderick and Madeline sharing uh, yeah. like a sin because there does seem to be a difference between them. But in the end of the day, it just doesn't fit if they don't. So Yeah. And I think it's and, flavors of greed. You mm -hmm. know, like she's the ambition greed and he's the hoarding greed. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think Roderick is the character that's supposed to be the stand in for Poe himself in this, in, you know, in the sense that uh, his mother died of when he was very young and he had a fraught relationship with his father and, you know, um, aspects of his personality, the being a ladies man kind of thing. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Yeah. For, so I, maybe I couldn't see past that to see, I think like his his sins to me were more complex, I guess. It was hard for me to like boil it down to one thing. Okay. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think Roderick certainly has quite a lot of failings and is the most melancholy and reflective in the end. Right, right. Yeah, I guess, yeah, there's remorse in the last moment in this case. Yeah. Um, I'm going to make my pitch anyway because I think it'll be good conversation for why they all have, have their sins. I think Madeline and Roderick are pretty clear you know they they made a deal so that they would have financial success in exchange for their right. lines right that's uh pretty greedy to me right uh freddie i picked sloth because even though he exhibits some wrath and some envy he in the end his his death is related to he failed to get the building knocked down in Doing times that job? prevent yeah. perry's death mm -hmm. he neglected his wife mm-hmm 
and then he dies paralyzed and unable to move laying on the ground so he's sloth yeah that's fair especially the um the whole building thing really makes yeah. it ring true for me yeah and and i did change victory i swapped victory and then roderick and madeline um the reason i did that is i i at first was really attached to making roderick and madeline pride because pride in almost every media that examines the seven deadly sins like full metal alchemist and whatnot pride is always like the leader right and i just yeah. my brain wanted it to be the head is pride but i just think it's unsupportable i think that's what i was objecting to when you showed me the first list because i did think that victorine was pride because yeah. you know verna yeah. says to her it's not about it's not about doing the good it's about getting the recognition for the good Right. I think I think that that's right. I think uh, that that's where my my error was, but it's corrected now. <laughs> um, Tamerlane. Tamerlane is envy. I, I mean, obviously, she's extremely jealous of Carla Gugino, who wouldn't be. And <laughs> um, yeah, you know, she she throws her husband out because of the jealousy. She she hurts Juno because of the jealousy. She can't see past it in the end. The envy consumes her, and and she gets yeah. killed by the very rage that is boiling up through it. And like with things like her husband, she's the one who's creating the envy out of nothing. You know, right. he's, he right. doesn't even want to do these dates with uh, the prostitutes. Right. You know, you what know. a weird concept. Which that <laughs> honestly, I thought it was it was both funny and horrifying to watch. Yeah. and I. I, I thought it was just really creative of Mike Flanagan. Yeah, I think so. Her episode is called Goldbug, um, but I think actually it's more based off the story William Wilson, which is about uh, someone seeing a doppelganger and getting more and more angry with them and like uh, causing because they see the doppelganger, they're ruining mm -hmm. their own life. And then they eventually see it in the mirror and realize it's themselves. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, Victorine, I think we talked about pride, you know, you, you mentioned she's like, you know, get it. She, she can't admit that this is a failure, right? She can't admit that her pro project has failed. Mm -hmm. Um, and she even goes so far as to, to hoard, not hoard, um, to, to forge the signatures of her, um, of her partner and to commit her to something that she's not comfortable with. I think that is, and she can't even admit that she killed her partner in the end. She's like, no, I made her heartbeat. Right. That was the spookiest. I think that was the spookiest death for me. Yeah. I mean, I think the, we'll get to Perry, that death was the most like memorable, you know, very cool death, so to speak, in a weird, gross way. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this was the most heartbreaking, I think. Yeah. Although, do you notice almost all of their partners died? Oh, yeah. It's the price of being involved with an usher, I guess. Yeah. Their partners died. Except for except for Leo's, uh, but we don't know what happens to him, and uh, and obviously Freddy's survives at the. Didn't last Didn't Tamerlane's moment. partner die, uh, live? Um. Oh yeah. True. I guess yeah. And That's I think true. only Victorine's partner. I think only Victorine's partner died. Uh. Well, Leo got his partners killed. Um. And yeah, maybe you're right. Did Leo's partner die? L yeah. The sorry, not Leo Perry. Perry, 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 Perry. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So Perry's partner died. Partners died. Is that it? And uh, Victorine, I guess. Oh yeah, and Victorine. Okay, so Perry and Victorine. Yeah, I guess. Okay, wait, C Camille. Um, Camille sent her assistants yeah. away. She didn't have any significant others. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I guess I was yeah. overthinking the deaths based on Perry and Victorine. Yeah, I think most of them walked away on skids. Even, even. Um, even Freddie's wife went went away eventually, and recovered. yeah, but she had a real rough time. Yeah, she that. did. She I mean, did. I have to wonder what kind of recovery that is after having all your skin burned off. All right. Well, Verna said, Verna promises she recovers. Okay. Yeah. Enough. Yeah. She she does good. Yeah. Yeah. She I she does enough to start a foundation and help a lot of people. Yeah. Um, going down the list, Leo Gluttony addicted to drugs. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I had him on the, on the platter for sloth for a little bit, but I think he ended up being gluttony. He, um, you know, he, he's overdoing the drugs. It makes him go crazy and kill the cat. And then that's what sets us all into motion. 
yeah, I I had the same thing where I started him in sloth, but then yeah, this seems more like it. Yeah. Um, Camille, Wrath, and this was one of the weakest alignments I thought because there was some lust going on and envy going on, but I think in the end, what killed her was this need for dirt against her sister. Right. This need to to get one. I got mine. Right. That's what mm-hmm. she says at the moment of her death. Right. Exactly. So I think she. So was yeah. Wrath. So I was thinking envy for her also, but I think it's more clear with Tammy. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, lastly, Perry. I think lust is a pretty easy assignment for him. He's literally throwing a sex party to die. Right. Um. Yeah. That w- I, I. I think that one left a little room for debate. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and it was obviously the red everywhere, which is probably one of the stronger color associations. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, that's that's my argument. I'm leaving it there. You've got an alternative reading, though, with this hop frog theory. Well, it's not. It's not. Uh, they can work together. Um, okay. But what I was thinking of is because there was the jester that popped up a few times, which actually comes from the Cask of Amontillado, which mm-hmm. is, you know, how the fate of Griswold ends. Um, but... Because that it got hop frog stuck in my head, but although I can understand why he skipped that story, he skipped a lot of stories. There's a lot of post stories, um, but and this is a story about a dwarf who's kidnapped and taken to another kingdom where the king is just hurls abuse at him all the time, dresses him up as a jester. Uh, but there's another kidnapped dwarf woman. Uh, she, however, is very beautiful, and so she and she dances for them, and she's a favorite and. Her friendship with Hop Frog is his only solace until one day uh, the king does something abusive to her and, and Hop Frog's like, well, you know what? That's it. We're done. Uh, and he plays a trick on the king. Now the king does at least acknowledge Hop Frog is uh, clever, so asks for costume advice to a party. And he gets all of the king and his seven council members to uh, dress up uh, as he says it's dressing up as orangutans, but what they're going to do is put on tight fitting clothes covered in tar and flax and chain them all up and hop frog will lead them, lead them in by the chain. Like he's caught a bunch of orangutans and uh, it's a hit at the party as he walks in, but then hop frog quickly uh, puts it on, like attaches it to the ceiling and raises them up so that they're like a chandelier over the party and lights them on fire. And yeah, so oh, wow. he yeah, burns them all alive ab- above the party, and he and uh, his friend run away. So okay, uh, so in this case, <laughs> Roderick is the king, and uh, you know his sister and his kids are his council of seven, and uh, Verna is Hopfrog in a way. Okay, all right, that's pretty interesting too. <laughs> Um, but it could, yeah, both can be, uh, both can be intended and probably neither. I don't know. <laughs> I, I like this. I like adding this here, um, especially cause we have the, the, uh, the jester going on, um, which, which also you said ties with the cask of a Amon- Amontillado, Amontillado. Amontillado. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a, the character who gets walled up in that story is also dressed as a jester at a party. Can I ask you, is the the alcohol that they're consuming in the last episode and when, um, you know, well, in, in the narration, in the armchairs and while they make the deal. The the cognac. Is that linked um, to Eddie Poe? So probably what that could be linked to is that there was someone who for like 60 years um, was called the Poe Toaster. And he would go and visit the grave of Poe on his birthday every year and leave three red roses and a bottle of cognac. Hmm. Um, yeah, so that, it's probably a nod to that is my best guess. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I like this hop frog theory. Um, the I, I actually really liked the way that the cask of Amontillado thing worked out in the show. Mm-hmm. It was really interesting to see what they did, how how cold the twins were about it. Yeah. That was chilling to me, especially Madeline. I think Madeline is deeply sociopathic. Yes. Absolutely does not have any empathy for anybody. 
Roderick, he changed over this whole experience. Do you, I mean, you can also see the way his uh, relationship with his wife, Annabelle Lee changed over this too, but that was really the moment when he's walling him in where it's like, okay, this is when he became the adult Roderick that we meet. Yeah. Yeah. He was I mean, kind before adult. that. Mm -hmm. He had, he had at least some sense of a moral compass before that. Right. And then towards the end, he kind of returns a little bit to himself and is self-reflective and is like, what did I, what did I become? Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. So sad. do you think, do you think Madeline's uh, at fault? Madeline, Madeline, whatever. Um, I think that they both are. He's his own person too. Mm -hmm. She certainly did goad him into a lot of bad stuff. <laughs> yeah. Fair. Um, but it, I don't think it's an excuse to be a passive person, right? If you're, if you are, you know, just because you're told to commit a crime doesn't mean you didn't commit the crime. Right. Uh, so I think they both share culpability. I think, She's scarier than him. I would rather go up against him than her uh, just because she has no remorse for anything. I think I think Roderick is very remorseful for making this deal. I think he blame you know, he he even admits he's like, I killed them. I, I did this. Um, and Madeline's like, oh, fuck us too now. You know, it, it, it's mm -hmm. like literally just has it gets an IUD because she's like, yeah, I took it seriously. I don't feel like having any of the consequences. You know, honestly, she's a smart one, but yeah, um, she, she's smart, but she's so cold and calculating that it's just terrifying. Yeah, it's true. It's true. And yeah, especially they had that contrast in the flashbacks between her and Annabelle Lee. Yeah. Like the angel yeah. and the devil on Roderick's shoulder and the devil won. Right. Right. Yeah, it's very sad. Poor Annabelle Lee. Um, yeah. I guess they they implied that she had uh, committed suicide at some point after mm -hmm. losing her children to Roderick. Yep. Oh, How man. Sad. Yeah. You see another partner that died. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of deaths, Lenore. Mm -hmm. She doesn't really fit into the sins. I no. think my my best theory for who she is is what could have been. You know, uh, she's the best of us. He says that like a million times. She's the best mm -hmm. of us. And I think the point is when you have all these deadly sins corrupting your life, you lose the best of yourself. You're the best of yourself goes down with it. Okay. And she was the best of all of them. Right. Yeah. Um, she took the best of all of them, all the, their best traits, and she still goes down because of their failures. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I agree. I see some, some themes from Poe poetry, like Maury is her mother and that comes from a poem or sorry, a story called Morella. And, um, it involves a woman who, who dies and, uh, in childbirth, she had been severely weakened before that. And, uh, the child ends up growing and look, growing up and looking more and more like her mother. And it's freaking the father out. And so he doesn't even name her until her 10th birthday. And he takes her to get baptized and the priest asks for the name. And at that moment he says, Morella and the little girl dies. Um, and there's oh. yeah, just, just by like naming. And she said, oh, yeah, he says Morella and she says, I am here. And then she passes away. So uh, there's like a lot of themes like that where women morph into another and someone carry the children, carry the sin of the parents sort of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. you know. Wow. I, I think in my hop frog analogy, maybe she's Trippetta, the, the pretty dancing uh, lady dwarf. But in that story, she does make it away with hop frog. So she gets a happier ending in that version. Okay. Okay. What do you think Mike Flanagan is trying to say with this series since we're wrapping up the, our discussion? Um, I mean, I think it, to me, it felt a lot like a tribute, but also like, Hey, look at these ideas that this guy was writing about in the 1800s that are still so applicable to the world today. Um, that we still, we're still suffering. We're still dooming ourselves to the same sins. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think it's meant to be casting a mirror back on the viewer as a lot of Mike Flanagan work is. What do you, what do you think? Yeah, it's interesting. I, um, I'm not an adherent to the 
beliefs of the de- seven deadly sins. Like I don't, no. I don't have any religious ties to them, but I think that they are poetically very relevant. You know, they are, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's sort of like negative human traits that you should watch in yourself. Right. I think all of these are legitimate critiques of the human psyche. And I think Lenore might be the lesson there, which is the best of you won't won't make it out if you if you let yourself fall to these other things, fall to these right. negative traits. Yeah, he seems to be casting a spotlight on consequences, like especially at the end, talking about how many thousands um, the opioid epidemic has killed. Right. Right. Yeah, that was a very cool visual effect and very horrifying. Mm hmm. Uh, and and you see Roderick and Madeline throughout the series try to justify the whole thing, right? Like, oh, they right. want they don't want to feel pain, and they blame us. And it's right. it's uh, it finally forces Roderick to confront his demons and confront the consequences of his actions. I think you're right. Consequence is really the main point of the series. Um, especially, I, I think you even have in the deal. Verna says you'll never face any legal consequences. Until right. the moment of your death, right? Your whole life, you'll never face any legal consequences. Right, yeah. Because when you don't face consequence, that's when really the worst of yourself comes out. Right. And August Dupin has to pay the price for them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this guy's career was ruined by them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I also found it very interesting that um, um, Pim that he is one of the only, basically he and Dupin are the two who say no to Verna, but they still suffer the consequences. You know, she bribed them. She's like, if you say yes to me, then uh, I'll give you these outs or, you know, this glory. And both of them are like, nah, what's the point? Or it's against my very moral fiber. And they end up suffering for it to a certain degree, especially Pim, I guess. Um, Yeah. Yeah. But Dupin, he says, you know, now I get to spend time with my family. Yeah, he's a rich man, right? That's yeah. that's what he says. Yeah. Yeah, but Pim, I guess he's just like, yeah, you know, I I, I like the way he says, I'm, I'm going to roll with the hand I have. Yeah. You know? Also, can we just say Mark Hamill was amazing in the series? Yeah, well, he was almost unrecognizable. I, I know. I, like the, I wonder if that hurt his voice. <laughs> I, I forgot that he was in this before I started right. watching. And I was like, is that Mark Hamill? Like, I I, uh, I couldn't believe it. He did such a good job. He, like you said, he was unrecognizable. The character was so different than the other ones I've seen him play. I mean, he usually plays either, you know, Luke Skywalker, be, you know, happy-go-lucky, or he's the Joker, right? Um, mm-hmm. he's, he's this uh, kooky guy. I mean, I think it, he was a fun archetype. My one thing I was saying on the Discord is that it, it, I heard more about how interesting he was than me seeing it, but I that I actually don't really mind that at all. Um, okay, he just he wasn't the most interesting character to me, but uh, I yeah, he was more of a device. He yeah. added he added a, a nice flavor, a nice seasoning to the mix. Yeah, I really liked the scene where he tries to kill Verna. And yeah. Verna is like, oh, I'm sorry I had to play with you, but it was just so fun to watch you work. <laughs> yeah. Very good stuff. Very good she, stuff. Yeah, and then, she must and have then a good she time. She steps on the body, right? And then right. it's just air. That was I, I really have to praise the way they economically used visual effects in this show. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they really did. They definitely went more practical than than they needed to, and I am glad that they did. I'm glad practical effects are back in fashion. I think part of it is need because of the backlog, but mm-hmm. part of it is and people cost, realize yeah. that it it yeah it cost. But part of it is I think people are realizing they're like, oh, there's a reason we used to do effects the way we did. You know, we don't need right. to do everything in digital effects. Right. Yeah. The best the best that I see is often a blending of the two. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I love this series. I hope people had a fun time talking with us about it. We don't have any feedback. I love feedback. this series. Yeah. We don't have any feedback, but uh, there's plenty of chatter on the Discord. So I, I hope you'll join us there. And of course, you can get even more discussion about this on Alicia's Wool Shift Dust Fee that you can find in the show notes. Alicia, let's wrap this up quick. Um, let's talk programming notes. Why don't you give the spiel about Wool Shift Dust since you're here? Uh, yeah, so we are going to be um, covering, you, you'll find also in the feed, 
an episode where I'm talking with Anthony about uh, of properly Howard fame, but we're on the Electric Bookaloo podcast talking about uh, Poe's influence on George R. R. Martin. And in the book club, uh, you'll find the um, reading of both uh, the Fall of the House of Usher and the Raven with sound effects. And then you'll find a soon, I think like next week um, in the main feed, there'll be the breakdown of the fall of the house of usher. And then the next thing up for wool shift dust is coverage of the new Hugh Howie adaptation beacon 23. Boy, Howie's busy. He's, he's getting all his works adapted now. Yeah, no smart man. Good for him. Good. For I him. mean, it's It makes for good TV. So his, his writing is inherently cinematic. So. Yeah, and I, he seems like a really down-to-earth nice guy, so I'm glad he's seeing success. Right, agreed. Uh, on Properly Howard, of course, they just finished their uh, remake season, but you can go back, listen to all those. You could either watch the movies with them or just laugh along as they joke about them. I was in tears laughing at The Thing when they covered that because they just... Uh, they, they have Steve has so many good jokes about it. Anthony, Anthony hops right in with them, too. Um, we just had a conversation with them on our new severance feed, which you can find in the show notes here as well. Um, that was we, hilarious. Yeah, we'll be covering. We Anthony asked us if you had to be severed, like in the show Severance, <laughs> where your consciousness is split. Would you rather be severed for all poops, all meals or all sex? And the answers were very funny. We had, <laughs> we had a great time. Uh, we'll be covering Severance Season 2 with them. And before that, they're going to cover all of Severance Season 1 on a rewatch on that feed. So definitely go and subscribe to there. For us, we are uh, covering Loki. I say we, but it's you, Alicia, and David right? and Sean. But you, but you are caught up in liking it, right? I'm caught up. I got to see if I can make a, a recording work. Maybe I'll send in a voicemail. I'll, I'll, be, okay. I'll be a classic. But you've um, been one back to the MCU enough that you started watching other things, too. I did. I'm on Iron Man 1 right now. I'm, ro- I'm watching okay. it timeline order right now. Good man. Yeah, we're, we're trying over here. I'm trying to I'm trying to put on my <laughs> cape again. And uh, yeah, so you're covering Loki, which is a really good season so far. I'm really enjoying it. And um, we are we just recorded an Earthsea episode. So Tehanu part one is coming out soon. Um, you Yay. and David and John recorded a one shot on the creator of the new movie. So that'll be out soon. Silmarillion stories are coming, second breakfast for patrons, and uh, plenty of other stuff. I think I think we're kind of back on the on the horse now that we're done with our triple coverage of September. <laughs> the, the blessings have passed. Triple blessings. Yep. All right, Alicia. I just want to thank our patrons before we go. We have our lore masters: Samartian, Cyrus, Mark H, Michael G, Michelle E, David W, Brian P, Nick W, S C, Peter O H, Bettina W, Adam S, Nancy M, Lavinia T. Duve 71, Brian 8063, Frederick H, Sarah L, Gareth C, Eric F, Matthew M, Sarah M, DJ Miwa, Andra B, Kwang Yu, Laura G, Dead Eye Jedi, Bob, Nathan T, Alex V, Aaron T, Sub Zero, and Adrian. Boy, that list is getting long. We love to see it. And uh, we're really grateful to all our patrons, which allow us to do these fun one shots, you know, get a little bit. Uh, more programming in than we would be able to without you. So thank you again for all your support. Alicia, been a, a super fun time talking to Mike Flanagan with you, and I hope people will join you on your feed. Yes. Uh, if you liked the retelling of Poe stories and uh, want to know what it's like if you hear my voice in double, then we'll see you on the Bullshit Dust feed. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We'll see you then. The Lorehounds podcast is produced and published by The Lorehounds. You can send questions and feedback and voicemails at thelorehounds.com slash contact. Get early and ad-free access to all Lorehounds podcasts at patreon.com slash thelorehounds. Any opinions stated are ours personally and do not reflect the opinion of or belong to any employers or other entities. Thanks for listening. Good news, MCU fans. We finally time slipped to the best of all Marvel content timelines. From the same team who faithfully broke down Secret Invasion episode by episode. We're finally getting our just desserts, a show that will have everyone talking in a good way with a side of suspiciously green key lime pie. Join me, David. 
and my co-hosts Jean and Alicia in the Lorehounds feed each week for a new helping of the MC universe as we break down Loki season two episode by episode, covering all the angles from casual fans to Marvel stands. Plus production news and rumors. And of course, comic book comparison. So pack your pruning sticks. And don't stand too close to the temporal loom. You're going to need a clear head for the time storm ahead because Kang is coming. Warning, the Lorehounds Loki coverage is part of a healthy podcast listening lifestyle. Side effects may include temporal mind meltdowns and irrevocable love for Oscar winner Kei Hui Kwan.